On today's episode of Space News, we're covering Blue Origin's failed protest of the lunar lander contract, the SpaceX Starship briefly reaching full height, Elon Musk offers to make spacesuits for NASA, drilling on Mars doesn't go as planned, and we find out a little more about what's gone wrong with the Boeing Starliner. This is The Space Race. The United States Government Accountability Office has officially rejected protests from both Blue Origin and Dynetics over NASA's award of the HLS moon lander contract to their competitor, SpaceX. It's been in the news for the past few months that Blue Origin, and particularly their founder Jeff Bezos, have been very upset over not being picked to build the landing vehicle for NASA's Artemis mission to the moon. You might recognize Jeff as the founder of Amazon, the sometimes richest man in the world, depending on how the stock market is going, and the living embodiment of comic villain Lex Luthor. And to literally no one's surprise, Bezos is a sore loser. Now I will say, Dynetics did also protest the loss, but their hearts didn't really seem in it. Feels like they were just going with the flow, or maybe they were hoping for a spot in Lex's Legion of Doom. Anyway, the basics of this whole protest was that NASA had originally intended to award contracts to two out of the three applicants. But in the end, they chose only SpaceX as the builder of the human landing system. This is the vehicle that will transport astronauts from lunar orbit to the surface of the moon, provide a base camp for the five days or so they will stay on the moon, and then fly them back up to orbit so they can come home. This rebuttal spurred Bezos to immediately jump up and start complaining that it wasn't fair that he didn't get to win too. And this complaint was elevated all the way to the Government Accountability Office, who spent 95 days investigating the situation. And now we finally get to see the results of that investigation. And to be honest, Blue Origin and Dynetics should have just kept quiet and lost gracefully because some of this stuff is just embarrassing. So first off, Upon further examination of NASA's announcement of the HLS program, they never promised to award two contracts. NASA did say they would prefer to award two contracts. They included the wording up to two and one or more, but two contracts was never a guarantee. We know that NASA prefers to work with multiple contractors on important projects. Take the ISS crew mission, for example. They awarded contracts to both SpaceX and Boeing, which was smart because the SpaceX Dragon has worked perfectly while the Boeing Starliner has been an abject failure. So in a perfect world, NASA wanted that redundancy for the moon lander, but this isn't a perfect world. And NASA did not receive anywhere near as much government funding for the Artemis project as they were expecting and therefore could only afford to hire one contractor for the mission. The GAO acknowledged this in their report, writing, even where a solicitation contains an intention to make multiple awards, we have recognized that an agency is not required to do so if the outcome of proposal evaluation dictates that only one contract should be awarded. For example, regardless of an agency's intention, it cannot, in making contract awards, exceed the funds available. But NASA didn't consider just money in their selection approach either. They used three weighted categories to evaluate each company, technical approach being the highest weight, price factor second, and management approach third. The GAO go on to state in their report that, contrary to the protesters' arguments, even assuming a comparative analysis was required, SpaceX's proposal appeared to be the highest rated under each of the three enumerated evaluation criteria, as well as the lowest priced. So SpaceX weren't just the lowest bidder, but they also exceeded or matched the competition in terms of technical abilities and management. We can see from the report that SpaceX received a technical judgment of acceptable, a management judgment of outstanding, and offered a price of $3 billion. Blue Origin was also rated acceptable on technical score, but received very good in the management column with an asking price of $6 billion. Dynetics actually received a lower technical rating of marginal and came in with an asking price of $9 billion. And this is what I mean when I say they should have just taken the L and shut up about it. Now everyone knows that Dynetics tried to ask triple the price of SpaceX for worse technology. So given the limited budget and considering the scoring and price point, SpaceX was the obvious winner, but that wasn't good enough for Blue Origin. 
Jeff Bezos even had the nerve to go straight to NASA with all the energy of a used car salesman and offer to knock $2 billion off the price if they just accept his blue balls lander. Sorry, I mean blue moon lander. If we dive a little deeper into those technical evaluations from NASA, we can actually see that SpaceX scored three significant strengths, 10 strengths, six weaknesses, and one significant weakness, while our friends Blue Origin ranked with 13 strengths, 14 weaknesses, and two significant weaknesses, which further drives home the point that SpaceX won because they had better technology and a lower price. They weren't just the lower bidder, they were by far the strongest applicant. The GAO report concluded by saying, even allowing for the possibility that the protesters could prevail on some small subset of their challenges to NASA's evaluation, the record reflects that NASA's evaluation was largely reasonable, and the relative competitive standing of the offerers under the non-price factors would not materially change, the protests are denied. Or, in more simple terms, your spaceships suck, walk on home, boys. Drop a like on the video today if you want to see more Jeff Bezos shit-talking in the future, or leave a comment if you think we should be nicer to him. Okay, moving on from Jeff, SpaceX have successfully completed their first test stack of the Starship and Super Heavy launch vehicles at their Starbase test facility in Texas. The brief combination of the two rocket stages made for the largest spaceship ever assembled, coming in at a height of 394 feet. Of course, the Saturn V flew to space and the Starship has yet to accomplish that feat, but SpaceX is working on it. Progress on the first orbital Starship is moving forward at a blistering speed down at Starbase. Elon Musk has called for all hands on deck and pulled SpaceX staff from all over the country to the village of Boca Chica to focus on getting their next generation of rocket into orbit this year. Elon tweeted that Starbase is moving at warp 9 in reference to the construction work. After working through multiple prototype stages, SpaceX has settled on booster BN4 and Starship S20 as their first orbital launch attempt. Yeah, 420. Elon says this is just a coincidence, and if he's right, then as far as I'm concerned, the universe or fate or God or whatever you want to call it has blessed this flight. But we know how much Elon loves that joke, so... I don't know if I trust him on this one. Anyway, we can see from the photos that Starship now has most of its heat shield installed, a series of black hexagons covering the side of the vehicle that will impact the Earth's atmosphere on its high-speed descent. Starship has also been loaded with six Raptor engines to power its flight into orbit and then hopefully allow the vehicle to come in for a slow and controlled vertical landing into the ocean. The booster has been loaded up with 29 of the Raptor engines, which should make it the most powerful launch vehicle ever built, with the capability to lift 150 tons into orbit. These subcooled liquid methane and liquid oxygen rocket engines will exert over 16 billion pounds of force during liftoff. Likewise, to the Starship, the Super Heavy booster is expected to come down for a controlled vertical landing in the ocean off the coast of Hawaii. Elon Musk says that SpaceX still have a lot of work to be done. They'll have to complete Starship S20's partially finished heat shield, install some form of heat shield to protect Super Heavy Booster 4's 29 naked Raptor engines, finish installing, plumbing, and activating four to seven massive custom propellant storage tanks, and assemble, install, and activate a giant mechanical umbilical arm on the launch tower to fuel and power Starship. There is also still more testing to be done on both launch vehicles. Starship will need to undergo the cryogenic proofing testing. That's where they fill the tanks with super cold liquid nitrogen to replicate the pressure of flight. It tests the structural integrity of the ship, if the ship fails the test, it basically just crumbles like an aluminum can under your foot. Starship has never gone through this test with six engine mounts installed. Finally, Starship will have to complete a static fire with six Raptor engines, another first for the vehicle. Booster 4 will be faced with an even more ambitious static fire test. We're not sure how many of the 29 Raptor engines they will try and light up on the first test for this booster, but eventually, SpaceX will have to see what happens when they burn all 29 at once. There's still a very real chance that this whole thing will just explode on the ground in a very spectacular manner. 
Finally, we are still waiting on the FAA to give their approval for the Starship Super Heavy vehicle. That approval could come within a month or could take a year. It's impossible to say with these kind of bureaucracies. Given SpaceX's track record with Starship prototypes and previous boosters, it's likely that they can get everything ready to launch within the next couple of months though. In a report from NASA's Inspector General, we've just learned that spacesuit development for the Artemis mission is both behind schedule and over budget, putting the entire mission to the moon in jeopardy. But can Elon save the day? According to the report, NASA has been working on three different spacesuit programs since the year 2007 and have spent $420 million so far. Seems like a perfect time for Elon to come in. It also finds that NASA intends to spend approximately $625 million more on development, testing, and qualification to complete the suit, which they don't expect to happen until 2025. For one, how do you spend 14 years and over $400 million and not even have one new spacesuit to show for your efforts? Holy shit. And two, this is the spacesuit that astronauts are supposed to be using for the Artemis mission to the moon, which is supposed to launch in 2024. If the suits aren't ready until 2025, that obviously screws up the entire time frame for the mission. This is spectacularly bad news. NASA are still to this day using spacesuits that were designed 45 years ago for the space shuttle program. They've made a couple of refurbishments and upgrades over the years, but these suits have no hope of living up to technical expectations of the Artemis mission. But luckily for everyone, Elon Musk took notice of the issue, the number 420 in the report probably caught his attention, and Elon made a simple tweet saying, SpaceX could do it if need be. You gotta love Elon's casual confidence here. Obviously, SpaceX makes dope suits for their Crew Dragon astronauts. The SpaceX suit is clean and futuristic, but it's not really a spacesuit per se. The suit they wear inside the Dragon capsule is mostly designed to protect the crew from fire or depressurization. It wouldn't do them good if they ended up outside of the spaceship, and you certainly couldn't walk on the moon wearing one. Now that's not to say that SpaceX doesn't already have a design for a proper spacesuit. We've never seen one from them, but that doesn't mean they haven't been working on it. I'd honestly be shocked if they didn't have something either on the drawing board or even in progress. I'm sure Elon has something specific in mind when he pretty much says, hey, if you're having trouble, we can just do it for you, no big deal. Or at least I hope he does. And even if they didn't, look at the speed in which SpaceX can innovate. No one should be surprised if they can get a full-blown spacesuit from design to production in two years. I mean, it took them about the same amount of time to get from the little Starhopper water tower thing to a full-blown orbital starship. So I think they can pull off some space clothes. And hopefully they do. It would be tragic to see our return to the moon put off by something as trivial as a spacesuit. And obviously, SpaceX have some skin in the game here. It's their Starship vehicle that will be doing the actual moon landing. I'm pretty confident that Elon can fix this. The NASA Perseverance rover's first attempt at extracting samples from the Martian surface didn't go according to plan. The car-sized Perseverance landed inside the red planet's Jezero crater this past February with two main tasks, to hunt for signs of past life on Mars and to collect and store samples for the future return to Earth. The idea is that the rover will drill into the surface with a sampling tube and extract some rocks. Same kind of thing we do on Earth all the time, like taking a core sample from a rock formation. But after drilling its first hole successfully, the rover's sampling tube came up empty. Thomas Zerbukin, Associate Administrator of NASA's Science Mission Directorate in Washington, said in a statement, While this is not the hole-in-one we hoped for, there was always risk with breaking new ground. He went on to say, I'm confident that we have the right team working on this and we will persevere towards a solution to ensure future success. Excellent use of puns by Tom there, but for real, what went on? We know the Perseverance has 43 sampling tubes on board, so we still have many more shots to make this work. The rover uses a 7-foot-long robotic arm to extend a percussive drill to the surface of the planet and bore into the Martian rock. Data received from Perseverance indicate that the drill, which has a hollow coring bit, worked as intended, and that processing of the sample tube appeared to be normal as well. It's just that coring bit came back with nothing inside. This outcome, a successfully drilled hole, but an empty tube, 
was never encountered during tests of the sampling system on Earth, according to the Perseverance team. It's not entirely unusual for this to be happening. We have a history with previous Mars rovers of finding rocks on the planet that just don't behave in the same way as rocks on our planet, which is pretty crazy to think about, but it makes a lot of sense. The hope is that NASA will be able to take at least 20 successful core samples with this particular rover, and that eventually these samples will be returned to Earth for further study, which is really exciting. NASA's idea right now is that they will send another spaceship to Mars in a couple of years that will send its own rover, collect the samples from the first rover, and then launch the samples into orbit around Mars, where they will be collected by yet another spaceship that will bring them back to Earth. That is the whole process, and that should take another 10 years to complete, so we'd be looking at 2031, which is cool, but... That's also around the same time that Elon Musk plans to start building his own city on Mars, so that might make this whole endeavor kind of a moot point. But kudos to NASA for trying, <laughs> they do their best. It's not that impressive, but it's not nothing. Okay, so we finally got some details on just what went wrong with the attempted second launch of the Boeing Starliner, and it's looking really bad for the entire project. The problem appears to be more severe than we had previously been led to believe, and that's casting doubt on Boeing's plans to still be able to launch the spacecraft later this month. Boeing Starliner is back in the hangar as engineering teams scramble to fix a problem related to the spacecraft's propulsion system. According to a statement from NASA, 13 valves in Starliner's propulsion system failed to open. These valves, as NASA says, connect to thrusters that enable abort and in-orbit maneuvering. This is yet another sad chapter in the story of the Boeing Starliner. On its first mission to space back in 2019, it managed to take off perfectly, but due to the clock on the spaceship not being set correctly, it got lost up there and never made it to the destination of the International Space Station. After a year and a half of implementing corrections recommended to them by NASA, Boeing was supposed to be ready to prove that this capsule was capable of transporting astronauts to the ISS, basically doing the same job that the SpaceX Crew Dragon has been doing for the past year now. But Boeing has actually regressed with their project, and this second attempt at flying Starliner couldn't even get off the ground. It's not clear when they'll try again. Apparently, NASA and United Launch Alliance are still looking at possible dates in August, but even a week now, after the failed launch, Boeing still have only been able to get six of their problemed valves to open. Seven of them are still stuck. This would all be comical if it wasn't such an incredible waste of time and money, but we'll keep you updated as the situation progresses. Thank you for watching the video today. We're still pretty new at this, so we really appreciate all of your support. Dropping a like on the video really helps our channel to grow. Leaving a comment is even better, and we really want to hear what you guys think of the latest space race news, so don't be shy. Hit up those comments down below. If you want to learn more about the space race, we've got two more videos up there on the screen for you. Please subscribe to our channel for weekly updates, and we'll see you in the next video.